Thanks for uh, joining us. Um, very excited to kick it off with, uh, uh, you can see with Professor of Physics, David Weiss uh, from Penn State. Um, Dave actually is from Stanford, got his PhD here with Steve Chu. Um, so he's one of our own, and it's, it's a pleasure to bring him back. Um, before that, he uh, got his bachelor's from Amherst. Um, his research, I mean, he had a common thread throughout the decades of Dave's research with creative creativity using optical dipole graphs, optical lattices, and in various ways. And I think you see here kind of the variety of what he's doing now. Um, for all this work, he's won an uh, enormous number of prizes. Um, I'll just read a few of them. Um, he won <laughs> in 2022 the APS Davidson Germer Prize in Atomic or Service Physics. And I'm old, actually. It's the oldest APS prize. Thank you. Of, um, uh, he's a fellow of many things, um, AAAS, yes. he's a Packard fellow, Sloan fellow, and all around good fellow. So <laughs> thank you uh, for joining us here today. Okay. Yeah, I'm uh, happy to be uh, back. Uh, if, for people who haven't worn here in the 80s, it looks very good. <laughs> So uh, I'll be talking about uh, experiments with one gases. Uh, these were done to a large degree by Yuan Look. And uh, in some of the earlier experiments I'm talking about, we're also done by Neil Malman and, and Josh Wilson, who put on new students uh, on that apparatus, or Emma Hoekman and uh, Shuning Green. Uh, the rest of my group is listed here. And we had theory collaborators on the one gas project, Yi uh, Zhang, uh, Marcos Rigo. Uh, Saran Gobal Krishnan and uh, John. So I'm told I don't need to give too much of a uh, an introduction or review of lattices uh, of optical uh, graphs, just for the few people who might not uh, be uh, mental about it. So I just point out that because the atoms are polarizable, they have an induced electric dipole moment, which gives them energy in the electric field, which in an energy which is proportional to the uh, electric field of oscillating, uh, uh, oscillating light squared, which means that you have a potential energy proportional to the intensity. So if you just think about what is the shape of the intensity as a functional position, that's the shape of your half graph. And uh, it's a conservative traffic with mark on resonance. Uh, and if you just make traps of interesting shapes, then you have uh, if you have light of interesting <laughs> shapes, you get uh, interesting shaped graphs. So a one-dimensional one optical lattice can be a record of the laser beam, which you can stack with pancakes, and we use that kind of uh, lattice in my uh, lab to do good measurements and sort of the electronic uh, If you have two-dimensional optical lattice, it gives you an array of uh, either a maxima or minima, that traps the atoms in tubes, and that's the experiment I'll be talking about today. If you have a three-dimensional optical lattice, you get something more like crystal lattice space, and that's the kind of lattice we use to uh, study single atom uh, qubits. Uh, and what we're trying to do in that experiment is create uh, large 3D clusters. So what I'm going to be talking about now is uh, these 1D gases that are excited out of equilibrium. And this many-body system Equilibrium is a frontier of physics. We use 1D gases because the uh, simplest 1D gases are integral systems, integral made by systems, which means that there's an extra large set of conserved quantities, and you can exactly solve for the ground state of these many by systems. In the actual experiments, we don't have strictly integral systems, we have nearly integral systems. And I mean that as a technical term, where over the course of the first Few slides, I'll explain what, what that means. Nearly integral. <clears throat> because of this integrability, and I'll also explain a little bit more about the integrability if that seems to mathematically. It's a real experimental thing I'm describing. Uh, starting with these systems, you can uh, study the dynamics uh, clearly and with time scales that are uh, often uh, clearly separable. And in not all cases, but in many cases, you can actually calculate what's going to happen with the systems. So the goal of uh, 
work that we're doing is that by using all the ways that we can study individual systems, or doing individual systems uh, quantitatively, we want to get insight into the dynamics of non individual systems or dynamic systems. Where the goal is to start from something which you really understand very well, you progressively make it a little bit more complicated and maybe you can then accomplish a whole lot of productivity. Start off talking about the lead linear model, integrability, and rapidities, which are related to the set of conserved quantities in the gas. And then I'll show how we measure momentum distributions in these gases and then how we can measure the rapidity distributions. And I'll talk about how we excite the gases. We do two different ways one with a trap quench, and then we use that to study generalized hydrodynamics, and then also with a wave function quench, which gives some surprising. Uh, Unexpected new physics. <clears throat> I will. Uh -huh. <laughs> Sorry to restart. Uh, I may need to restart. I may not have an idea why. Okay, talk amongst yourselves. <laughs> Anybody want to do uh, okay. 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 So, um, yeah, as a starting point to understand what's going on in one dimension. It's convenient to consider just two uh, particles. If you look at the relative wave function of two particles, uh, the, um, the behavior of bosons is different. So bosons, if you have two particles where this is the relative coordinate, so this is some well-defined uh, momentum the particles not relative to each other, they wiggle, then from the point of interaction, it has to be symmetric. Uh, you know, from the point of contact where it's symmetric, if there's no interaction. And fermions would be a similar thing, but it's got to be an antithesis. Now, if you have infinite repulsive delta center interactions with the opposite of non interactions, then uh, you still have a symmetrized wave function uh, for the photons, but it, it costs too much energy to uh, have them be at the same place. So the, the two body wave function looks like this. And what uh, if you take the Fermi gas with no interactions? And just multiply by the signum function, which is say just take the plus side and multiply by a minus sign, and you get this uh, wave function. And you see that that looks just like this. So, this mapping of non interacting fermions with this uh, sign to uh, the uh, atomic stereo gas, which is this delta gas, is uh, long been understood as a fermionization of one of those bosons. And all properties that depend upon the wave function squared, we look at this, we we'll look at this, are the same. So things like energies and spatial distribution, local territory, are all the same between the contrary gas infinite delta function interaction and the non interaction. Mm -hmm. And if you have non local properties, like the momentum, and upon the correlation of the wave function and one plus, whatever you see that's different for here than the Permutation in some situations, and but there's it's not a perfect mapping there. So you, bosons, even with infinite interactions, is not the same as permutation. So the lead linear model is a simple Hamiltonian, is kinetic energy term for every particle, and then a pairwise delta function interaction term for every pair with a variable interaction uh, energy. And what was shown in 1963 is that uh, you can exactly solve for the, the wave functions uh, that describe this uh, with Hamiltonian if you parameterize the distribution by this dimensionless coupling string gamma. Right, gamma depends upon G1D, it depends upon the point density and fundamental constants. You get exact solutions parameterized by that. It's an interval model, which is part of the parcel to uh, these exact solutions, 
which means that there's extra constants of motions. And in this homogeneous gas, those extra constants of motions are called the rapidities. And next side, that's 110 rapidity. Uh, the next step in this history is a whole lot of theory between 1963 and 1998, but Maxine will try to show that if you have a real atom, you know, a 3D atom and a waveguide, and it's pulled to the, to the ground state of that waveguide, the actual scattering maps extremely well onto this. So to understand what those solutions are like, we can look at the different regimes of gamma difference. So gamma is much greater than one. That's the regime of this zero gas. That's where if you look at the probability of two particles being in the same place, it's zero. So this is sort of like a cartoon correlation between the particles. You'll never find two particles in place with this gene under gravity constant. That happens in one day your gene gets large or when the density is low. Go to the opposite limit where uh, gamma is much less than one, then it doesn't cost you that much for the particles to be overlapped. So in the uh, solution, it gives you wave functions where the mean field and uh, set up high density and uh, it's small. So this is limited permutation of uh, the uh, Bose gas in the sense that it's described. Now, property of any equilibrium of these 1D gases have been demonstrated in my lab and in many other labs. And all of those experiments need a trap somehow. When you put the atoms in a trap, then that actually lifts the energy load. Uh, but the way to solve for what's going on with the atoms in the trap is you use a local density approximation. Which is, say you take whatever the density is at one point in the trap, and you get the lead limit of solution associated with that point in the trap, and then you know, put the whole thing together to get the full solution. Now, this adding the trap lifts the energy ability, but it, it's only slightly less than you to say it keeps you generally in that leaves you with a nearly formats and all that kind of stuff. That's how I feel about your time. Okay. <laughs> Just as one uh, baseline of the dynamic equilibrium, I pointed this experiment, which we did some time ago, where uh, we showed essentially measuring the local pair correlation, which is something like the probability of two particles being in the same place. And if you do that as a function of this uh, dimensional coupling shape gamma, you see that uh, it goes from what would be one at very low gamma, uh, just like a 3D BC. And then if you go to strong coupling strength, it starts to approach zero. And that's the permutation. So to talk about what nearly integral means, uh, it's you sort of have one other way to look at what the building is. So if you have three particles that collide, and this is position in space, and they collide at some point in space, then if you have an integral system, the three momentum that they came into for that collision are the same as the three momentum. That's true about three body, four body, any number of bodies. If you have a collision, they are non diffractive which is to say they don't change the uh, momentum or the, uh, the distribution. So what I mean by a nearly integral uh, system is something where the rate of these diffractive free body collisions, the ones that characterize the non-integral systems, is small compared to other dimensions. So I have to talk to them, uh, You'd have to talk to them mathematically. This is, I mean, diffractive <laughs> and they're going from, from some closed space to some other space. Right? The only reason diffractive kind of Rankles in some way is to seem like it's the phenomenon of diffraction. So it's not diffraction, it's just a change in moment. I see. So it's not surprising that if you put the atom in a trap, that that's going to barely uh, change what the, any three body collision looks like in a trap, as long as there's not a lot of curvature over the sort of distance scale that the collision happens. So it's not surprising that that would, be, that would keep the system nearly. And an example of that is this uh, Newton's cradle experiment we did where you take the atoms and you put them out of equilibrium and then you look at them for a long time and you see that it doesn't, it, it approaches the state, which is not the thermal state because the system can never thermalize because there are no bracket collisions with this. Undergone balance. Okay. 
Okay, so there are two ways to define uh, rapidness. They are either the set of conserved quantities in interval system, which is true for if it's part of the uh, solution of the legal interval. Or there's the momentum of the quasi particles that arise, right? And this is five quasi particles where there's a, an entire reshaping of uh, the system so that each quasi particle is formed by some uh, a description that involves all the all the individual particles, all the pair of particles. So the pair of particles together, when you when you uh, form strings out of them, give you a set of quasi particles. Those quasi particles have some momentum, and the momentum, those momentum are the rapidities. So I gave this cartoon picture to begin with of what the single particle wave functions, the correlations look like in real space. You see, it's very different for high gamma, low gamma. But if you look at the same thing in rapidity space, where this is a function of rapidities, you see that first in the limit where it's easy to calculate things. The Trudeau gas, it's like a Fermi gas. If you have a, an even equal distribution of uh, rapidities, where all the available rapidity uh, states are filled up, the, 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 your zero temperature is filled up, up to some uh, Fermi energy. But whatever the, uh, the coupling strength, the actual solution in terms of rapidities looks pretty similar. I mean, for intermediate coupling, the separation is no longer equal between the states, and that's part of the legal linear solution. It's finding exactly what this energy distribution is. The qualitative behavior of the 1D gas, regardless of what the coupling strength is, is still set up like with a bunch of quantity uh, <clears throat> particles, which at zero temperature fill up the rapidity space of the sun. Now, in a homogeneous system where there's no trap or just a flat trap, these are the definitions of the same. It's, uh, you know, there's just two different ways to describe the same thing. But if you're in a trap, then uh, the rapidities are no longer conserved by the first definition, right? That is, the trap exerts a force on these quadrant particles. But this def definition based upon the momentum of the quantum particles, full step that I'm going to describe uh, rapidities. Good. Yeah, sort of maybe naive question. Uh, <coughs> what's the definition of a quasi particle when it's no longer triple? When it's no longer. So, like, I know what the quasi particle is when it's in the lead limit group. Right. Then, yeah. So, what is the quasi particle? When we can't that? So, the quasi particle is, uh, I mean, I'll, I'll part, part of what's going to ask your question is the slide that I have. It. So, the point is you do a uh, local density approximation and you get a, a, say, an equilibrium, or if the thing has uh, done whatever sort of uh, pre thermalization it's going to have done uh, in some local area. There is a uh, distribution of rapidities. There's the quasi particles that are sort of defined in that part of the track. Okay, uh, the quasi particles will move around, but as long as uh, there are no three body diffractive collisions, as long as you don't sort of leave that space, then they live forever. Right? So you can still think of the quasi particles as you know, they're involving all the particles. There's a certain delocalization, but they just move through your trap and uh, they. They last for time and last forever. So, mm -hmm. They just get a time and last Yeah, I mean, eventually they start to find that. But in the nearly mm -hmm. near the limit, that lifetime is longer than your experiment. The, uh, so, and this fact of uh, that you're so close to interability allows you to actually use that feature to say that a higher analysis is going to get a few along, but I just say it's related. This long lived nature of life. So, uh, if just again, I uh, uh, more used to think about what rapidities are, what momentum are, if you had an fermions, you know, harmonic trap, the distribution of uh, momenta is just this hump fermionic distribution. The distribution of rapidity is exactly the same as the distribution of momenta because the quasi particles are the same state as the particles in this non interactive system. Now, the time gas 
has a very peak momentum distribution. Right? It doesn't look harmonized as far as momentum distribution is It's like what you more expect for uh, a bosonic distribution to be in a large occupation of a single state. But if you look at the distribution of opinions for the nitro gas, it's the same as the uh, non direct and of course, if I turn off the trap, it doesn't do anything. It's the act of turning off the trap doesn't change the momentum distribution, doesn't change the big distributions. <clears throat> so you have to do something over some time to change, change those things. So one final thing to talk about before we start talking about the experiment is that if you have atoms that are initially trapped, these one of those gases are trapped, and then you release them in a flat trap, I mean, a flat potential, so there's no trapping or just expanding in space, then that whole time their rapidities are conserved. But because you know, if the trap isn't an exerted force on the rapidities, you can't But uh, as the particles push against each other, the momentum distribution does change. right? And when you get to the point where the density is sufficiently low that the energy associated with the interactions among the particles is small. Then uh, the in the sense of, of uh, what their momentum distribution is like, the the real particles start to look like the quasi particles, which means that the asymptotic momentum distribution doing this expansion is the rapidity distribution. The rapidity distribution that hasn't changed the whole time. Momentum distribution starts off different. So it's for instance in the Tantrio gas where you can calculate this, uh, you start off with a momentum distribution which is peaked. You let the thing expand in 1D, and that momentum distribution then transforms into this uh, the uh, momentum distribution of the fermion, which is saying into the So, for a country, I guess this process is called dynamical fermionization. But uh, for any gas, whatever the coupling strength is, it is a way to measure the rapidity distribution. So, rapidity distribution, which for some time would have, you would have thought that it was just something which was a bookkeeping trick to keep track of certain quantities, it's something that you can actually specifically measure if you do this procedure. Okay, so we do an experiment in a uh, 2D lattice where the lattice beams are very large, so all the two or the atoms are the same. And uh, the atoms are free to move. In this picture, out of the page, there's a bundle of tubes. And it's a blue detuned lattice, so uh, there's very little uh, trapping actually. There's a slight anti trapping actually associated with the lattice. But we then trap them in one dimension with red detuned uh, traps, not a lattice, it's just dipole beams, which cap the, uh, the atoms in the uh, axial direction. Right, So we can independently. Change the trapping in the axial direction from the trapping that puts them in. These are one system because we're starting off with both condensates, and all the energies in the problem are smaller than the energy it takes to excite into the transverse state. We've really frozen out the transverse of freedom. And we also have the lattice depth, the 2D lattice depth, high enough so that there's negligible tunneling on the time scale to start. So that's the sense in which it's we can do a dynamical fermentation measurement or a rapidity measurement. We uh, turn off the axial trap mostly just so what we're left off is something which is just flat over the range of study time. And then we let the atoms evolve for some time p evolution. After that evolution time, we do a measurement of momentum distribution, which I'll describe in next two slides. As long as t evolution is sufficiently large, that momentum measurement, momentum distribution measurement, is the rapidity distribution. Okay, so to measure the momentum, we suddenly turn off the 2D mass. So if these are four uh, atoms in two, four tubes that we're looking at edge on, if you suddenly let them off, they'll start flying apart transversely, and very rapidly you'll turn off all the Interaction make them the interaction. And uh, so you do that, and then what's left then if you look in a time of flight in the 1D is the momentum distribution at the point of time which uh, draws these, these uh, 
is less. So what that looks like is this. So this is a, a 1D distribution where it's really wide in this direction because the atoms are flying apart rapidly. So what you do is you just integrate in this direction and then look at the distribution in this direction, which is the 1D. So this is a situation where in the top of the picture, we just don't have any evolution in uh, the 1D lattice. So that'll give us the initial momentum distribution. But over here, the atoms have pushed against each other for some time, and you see that that changes the distribution, and uh, that will be, it's a long enough time to be a good distribution. This is what the experiment looks like from the beginning, where you start off with a, a peak a momentum distribution, and then it evolves into this hump fermionic distribution, which is then asymptotic, it doesn't change anymore, because interaction is all be given up. And this is a theoretical calculation, taking into account all the other details of the uh, experiment. And you see particularly that it agrees extremely well uh, for the asymptotic uh, distribution, which is, uh, in this case, a measurement of that organization. And in general, it uh, serves as a, a, a way to validate that when we're measuring rapidity distributions, the ways I, I described, it is really the rapidity distribution. Just note because otherwise you can't. You know, this a strong interacting limit is only place you can actually do these. Things. Okay, so having shown that we can measure rapidity distributions, yeah. So how are these rapidities uh, defined? I mean, they're like mathematical quantities which are conserved, but then there should be some ordering because you're plotting them on the max axis, and so there's like, you know, in the end, you compare them to like momentum, to the momentum distribution, where you have a natural ordering. So yeah, so why is the natural, I mean, the rapidities are like a set of momenta of these particles, so there's no ordering. You know, a higher rapidity shows up on a graph as higher rapidity. There's no other ordering beyond what you, See there, I mean, this is the rapidity distribution. Yeah, what I'm asking is like, these are like mathematical quantities, isn't it? So let's say we have quantity one, two, three, four, but how do I know like how I would plot them if I, if I don't compare them to long time scales and the momentum distribution? Yeah, like, right. I think at some level, I'm not really understanding what kind of ordering you, you want on this. Because, I mean, they're, they're uh, the, uh, Certainly, you can't associate an individual particle with these of these rapidities because all the particles are going to be But uh, you could uh, you could assign a range of uh, individual project particle with, uh, and the order is just you know, this is the server rapidity, this is the order rapidity. Maybe we should talk about it after because I don't think I can do better than that because I don't really understand. Okay, so from equilibrium, you then start to do the quench. We start off with uh, trap quenches, where, and uh, the first idea for, for doing this was uh, uh, theoretical from work done by uh, Muguzi and uh, Ganger in 2005, where they imagine starting off in a, uh, in a deep trap and then quenching to a uh, trap with one tenth the oscillation frequency. And then they uh, considered what happened. This is in the time sure against limit. So there you start off with a uh, in you're looking at the momentum distribution with this bosonic P momentum distribution. After some time, you get this fermionic clump momentum distribution, which is really just like dynamic fermionization. Right? But then eventually it's going to start slowing down in this trap, and it slows down and then gives you something which at the end is a bosonic distribution with a narrower uh, spread. And then uh, you just have this thing repeating again and again. Um, so we did that experiment, and uh, the data is in blue. The theory for the hydro gas is in red. Uh, I know that the data is for an average gamma, which varies between eight and two, ten times. If you look at what these distributions are like, it goes from bosonic to fermionic, to bosonic to fermionic, approximately 
back and forth. This is comparing the uh, theory and the data at the corresponding points of this oscillation. You see that the period is a little different, the amplitude is a little different. So the qualitative behavior for these finite couple of gas is not so different from the time show gas, which is sort of what you'd expect from that cartoon picture of what the rapidities look like that I described. But uh, quantitatively, it's it's not the same. So what was really wanted in, for this uh, work is to understand uh, in four arbitrary gamma, how can you quantitatively calculate what goes on? And the solution to that is generalized hydrodynamics, which uh, I'll just say a few things about. You know, one is that it's just like hydrogen coupling equations where it's uh, uh, the density is, is a function of position and time in different cells uh, coupled together. The, uh, the difference is that there's also the rapidity distribution. So basically an equation like this for every rapidity. And then a lot of the work is being done by this quasi-particle group velocity, which uh, in the GHD theory, you can get as long as the system satisfies the local generalized Gibbs ensemble, which is to say satisfies the, uh, it, it's like it's in equilibrium locally according to the uh, so, so with that, you have a set of equations that should, if uh, the following assumptions hold true, that the system is nearly integrable, so the particles last forever, you can describe the whole thing with a continuum distribution, and you are actually locally equilibrated. If all those things are true, then you can show that this generalized dynamics, hydrodynamics is a way to, to uh, look at these dynamics. The first experiment that uh, tested it was uh, in uh, Isabel Bouchel's lab, where they had a, uh, a relatively high temperature gas near the uh, density particle in the region of sweet coupling, uh, less than 1%. With a, a relatively small quench, and what they're doing is they're measuring the position, and you see it agrees pretty well. You see that the uh, theory and the uh, data are uh, well overlapped. And if you try to do this with some sort of uh, non GHD uh, hydrodynamic model, it does not agree nearly as well. So we set out to test this in the other limits where it's closer to zero temperature, strong and intermediate coupling, and with as large a quench as we can do. And then what we're doing when we're measuring the time is measuring the rapidity distribution of how that happens. And here I know there are other experiments that are ongoing, uh, have been done here in uh, Ben's group, uh, Indiana, in his very career, our group, and then the all group. All looking at uh, things with extra inputs. Okay, so this is what we see after a hundred times quench, measuring the rapidity distribution, starting off with uh, with gamma equals uh, nine point three, and uh, so you see this quench. We start with a narrow rapidity distribution, and we're making the, here our quenches instead of from a uh, a weak to a shallow trap is from a shallow to a, a deep trap. So that's technically a lot easier to do, and uh, you see that. The rapidity distribution starts to get broader. This is at the point of maximum compression. And then it widens up again and comes back to the same starting point approximately. It does it again. It's kind of a system. It just uh, doesn't quite repeat, but it's going to qualitatively repeat. So that's the experimental data across that whole range. We do the GHD theory for a bundle of tubes. That's the GHD theory. Just show you that one more time. Back <laughs> is the uh, experiment. That's the theory and these coming together, which is to say that uh, it works pretty well. In particular, this is a situation where there's an average of 11 atoms per tube, where you might think that the uh, the uh, hydrodynamic description might fail, but it doesn't work well. And uh, so this continuum rock approximation is a pretty plausible thing to get out of real experiments. If you look at the evolution of the energy, uh, it looks like this is you get the energy by just adding up the rapidities, uh, you know, weighted rapidities, weighted as the square of the rapidities. That's the energy. Uh, you see it oscillates in a way that agrees with the, uh, with the theory. Uh, we can measure the kinetic energy by measuring the momentum distribution instead of the rapidity distribution. 
It also agrees uh, well with, although you can't actually measure the momentum distribution, you can infer what the kinetic energy should be. And it agrees well, except for at the highest density points, because the highest density points, you can't turn off the traps fast enough to not have some evolution of the energy in that time. But uh, once it's past the high density point, it gets more curve. And you know, the difference between those is actually a direct measurement of how much energy is stored in the interactions of the particles at this point of peak compression. So to get a sense for what's happening here in the experiments is that we're starting off with lengths that are 17 microns across, well, across these tubes. We slam them together so that they compress to a length of only a half a micron. Through this time, the gamma is changing from about nine to about 0.2. So it's going through, you know, when you look at the detailed, uh, you know, what the correlations are among the particles, they are dramatically changing through this whole time, yet the GHT theory keeps track of it all, keeps track of all those changes, and, uh, and still shows that, uh, you know, those assumptions are, that underlie GHT are, are good enough. To so let's just think that nothing is really happening, but it just kind of repeats itself. It doesn't quite. So this is six cycles in, where you start to get some funkier distributions in the uh, in the uh, theory and the experiment, and they agree with each other to within small uh, experimental imperfections. So uh, taking a many body system and looking at dynamics, somewhere like six cycles in our oscillation is not something you can do in other in other many body systems. Okay, so. GHD works. So because we're good experimentalists, the next thing to do is to make it not work. See what we can do to break it. So the way we do it is we do a wave function quench. We pulse on a, uh, a Bragg pulse beam, which uh, right after that, because you get an oscillation of straight distribution, right after that pulse, the generalized good ensemble is not satisfied. And in fact, there's no way to do the theory for what's going on over there except for in this function. And what we see is this, we see a, a distribution of momentum uh, varying as a function of time. The uh, dominant thing is that over the early, uh, over a relatively short time, the distribution sort of expands. And eventually, because you're putting on Bragg peaks, they're going to start rising up the sides of the trap. But that takes a while for it to happen. And the oscillation period of the whole trap is 16 milliseconds. But all, everything we're going to talk about now is happening in well less than a half a millisecond. Right, so, and that's at a point where the effect of the trap is really uh, nothing. So, so, essentially, we're looking at things that are not affected by the trap from the point of view. Since the most obvious feature is this increase in the width, I'll talk about that first, although that's not actually the first thing that happens. So, that change in the width is local free thermalization. And, uh, and that is the process in which you've taken it so that the local GD is not satisfied and you watch it evolve towards satisfying the local GD. There's a qualitative argument that we made, which is that it can't be faster than the time it takes for the uh, side peaks to move and moving at a velocity 2 h bar k over m, move over some distance corresponding to the fluctuation of a given moment. So uh, that's a, a lower limit on the time, which is proportional to one over the size of the kick that they're giving and whatever momentum you're <coughs> Now it turns out studying those momentum is a little bit complicated because uh, each momentum does a pretty complicated thing, you know, does a different thing uh, than every other momentum. But we did find a way to uh, Look at as we change the density. Look at how just the edge of the uh, the uh, momentum distribution changed. So what we define this quantity p fifty, which is the uh, momentum of which half the particles are in the first cell, so one to k to minus one to k, half of them are below p fifty and half of them are above p fifty. Then you look at how that p fifty changes as a function of time. You see these reasonably well behaved. Uh, Transitions, and you plot it up, you see that that time associated with these transitions is uh, linear with uh, 1 over P50, which is also linear with the square root of Fermi energy associated with that, uh, with that gas, which is then that's the experiment, that's the theory. Uh, qualitatively, uh, 
it explains what we see. This sort of simple model explains what we see. Before we go to continue to study uh, what happens in local breathing on site, which is probably So, what I want to talk about spending a little more time is a thing that we weren't expecting. That's what we were trying to, to uh, study that was this local renormalization. But we saw something else at earlier times. And uh, it goes by the name of hydrodynamization, which is a mouthful, and it's not my <laughs> fault. And it came out of uh, relative behind what they started talking about. They, they gave the name of the book. Oh, I'm not hydrodynamization. Did that come from a German? Uh, <laughs> I don't know. I'm, I'm not sure anyone's taking credit for it. <laughs> anyway. uh, the uh, what they saw, what it refers to, is that if you're looking at the result of a relativistic ionic collision, and um, and uh, you try to map out what happens after, it seems like you can describe the evolution by hydrodynamics from very early in the time, even before there's enough time for the system to be locally. Firmly equilibrated uh, in that uh, in, in whatever small volume I'm using to describe the hydrodynamics. So uh, and they see that effect in a bunch of high energy collision models, but it's also a little bit mysterious in that uh, you know that it comes about in this way that you have this rapid you know, some rapid change, and then you you can uh, use hydrodynamics to the system. And it, it happens, this hydrodynamization has to go fast as it can be. And they see that there's a change of uh, energy distribution of mind behind the modes, but uh, from there, hydrodynamics. So, what we have is uh, it's a similar physics to that, but just much clearer, much, much cleaner to see what's going on. So, the same thing I showed after the crack balls, if we look at the rapidity distribution, not surprisingly, it doesn't change. Like this in this early time before the atoms on the size circuit, five and seven, the rapidity are conserved. So the phase of each rapidity component evolves according to its four phase proportion to the rapidity squared. So we know that the relationship between the rapidities and the momentum is very complicated mapping. And uh, it's a mapping we generally can't even do. We can't even break that down. Except for the natural language. But uh, we know if the phases of the rapidities are changing like this, then the actual occupation of the different momentum modes have to be changing on a comparable time scale to this change in the rapidities. So, uh, so you, you can see because you set this large uh, range of rapidity energies in place, you'd expect that the momenta are going to change at, uh, at this very high time scale where the Hydronization time scale for this, which is the difference in energy center peak and side peaks of say the microsecond. Also note that integrability, all that makes it easy to see what's going on, is not necessary for this process. Right? Because on this time scale, you know, if you had some sort of uh, quasi particle distribution, nothing can change as fast as this. Like the only thing that you need to see something like this hydronization is this large spread in energies. Groups happen so much. So, this is the momentum distribution that I showed before. The way we're going to analyze it is we're going to break the things down in different momentum groups and look at the energy in each of these momentum groups and how it evolves in time. And this is on a log scale, this function of time, log linear scale. But you can see all of it together. Uh, there's different things happening. So, the black is the center of the center beat. There's not a lot of energy there. Uh, this is where the most energy is on the peaks of the side, and then in between, these are all these intermediate momentum groups. And uh, there's a few things that happen. I'm going to switch to the linear scale, which is going to be easier to look at say, the things over here, right at this peak, where you see a hydrodynamization kind of oscillation, which damps up over uh, some time. And then, uh, and then uh, on the peak of this, you also see uh, some. Opposite hydronization uh, change, which stamps out over some time. And then in the middle, you see this very rapid change is happening on like the hydronization time scale divided by 2 pi, which is to say uh, it's this. And you know, the reason that happens is because when you're over here, presumably those momentum groups are drawing from all the rapidity 
groups from the side and to the other side. So you have a lot of things oscillating at the hyperionization time scale, but uh, with a very rapid dephasing uh, associated with uh, slightly different hyper, slightly different high frequency oscillations. So it's a little bit like uh, spontaneous emission. You uh, have the space time scale, but then the change when you're looking at these components that draw the that, that, uh, draw components changes in training rapidly. So this is the qualitative behavior is uh, sort of understood here, keeping in mind that the detailed behavior is something that we can't extract now because you must have that uh, detailed theory. So that's what the experimental kinetic energy uh, distribution looks like as a function of uh, groups. The theory in the hardcore limit with a couple of total energy looks very similar. Right, although in some of the details it's not the same, then again, it shouldn't describe the same thing. It should just qualitatively describe the same thing. And I note that on the same sort of picture, if you look at the rapidities, they don't change it. There's another way to look at this spatially, which is that, and this is only from the theory, uh, that right after the quench, you have this oscillation in space, the hydronization oscillation time scale you see over here. Uh, where the density changes in this direction, then uh, this these density changes uh, dephase uh, uh, what is uh, in the dephasing is actually uh, depends just upon the widths. So the dephasing for that is the same as the uh, for the theory and the, and the experiment, but then there's local rethermization which happens after that. But the local rethermization involves much smaller changes. Another way to look at this uh, spatially is that we have these three momentum peaks, and uh, hydronization involves the energy going from the side grab peaks into the intermediate momentum. And it can sometimes do that very fast. It can, in fact, it can do it faster than the time it would take for a particle to actually traverse into a particle separate uh, space. Okay, so it's just a purely quantum mechanical effect. With no Classical, uh, and then the subsequent local pre-thermalization which happens isn't a redistribution among all the momentum scales. It's just more of a flow of momenta from some momentum groups to the nearby momentum groups over time, which is local pre-thermalization, the space analogous to regular thermalization, and it's qualitatively like similar over here, where the uh, uh, these compressed uh, uh, um, you know, Lorentz uh, contracted uh, particles that collide and immediately form quantum plasma in a short period of time. Let's say qualitatively the same as this, just 18 or 19. Now, in our experiment, but in a way that I haven't explicitly described, but a little bit more thought makes it clear because the rapidity distribution is not actually changing, GHD clearly works before local pre now, they maybe not to, in the world of equations, maybe not to the same sort of uh, precision, say that it works before uh, the hydrodynamics work before pre -therm local thermalization. But it is an open question, which is probably amenable to some experiments as to whether, if the rapidity distribution is rapidly evolving during local pre thermalization, does GHG still work in that case? And I'd say that is something. Okay, so what I'm talking about is uh, you look at one of those gases and measure uh, rapidities, and then uh, with that concept, test out of equilibrium dynamics using generalized hydrodynamics. Uh, if we have a, uh, that's where the trap bench, if we have a wave function crunch, then you can temporarily buy the conditions for GHD, but then watch the uh, system approach uh, the local generalized Gibbs ensemble in this case. But if you have the appropriate kind of quench, the first thing that happens is sort of more universal amount of air. Uh, so this nearly integral space is already pretty large because it's not, it doesn't just require the perfection of integrability. You can be not integrable and still, uh, still model the system pretty well. But one of the things that we're trying to do going forward is to 
purposely add non heritable terms to try to see if we can use the success that you can uh, have for description with uh, nearly animal systems into progressively non animal systems and maybe get it in this way an approach to understanding an even wider range of numbers. Okay. Yes. Yes. Uh, I want to ask about the experiments of the axial squeezing and so the oscillation. That's um, how did the time scale for that squeezing, which was pretty quick compared to the pre fermentation rate, should you expect that the GPD was holding during that process, or was that also maybe more like the hydrogen? Yeah. So, so for that collapse, all, all that stuff after the wave function thing, you know, it's probably fast. It's still much slower than what we're doing. So, uh, in fact, you know, you're hard pressed to do it. But just like that, and uh, and do it faster. Than it it's and not as fast as I don't get. So, you make this comment that the hydrodynamization. That's got pretty good. Have you, have you practiced before? You well, I, I have to say, while we while you were answering his question, I was practicing in my head so that I could say it right. Uh, actually, that's all I wanted to say. Yeah. We're, 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 <laughs> um, so my, my actual question is that you, you made this comment that it occurs faster than the collision time. So should I think of this, the hydrodynamization as single particle physics? No, it sounds Absolutely, many body physics. The only way to think about this is this many body wave function, right? If you didn't have, uh, I mean, I, I can you can see why it has to be many body effect because if there were no interactions, then the quantity particles would be the same as the bare particles, and therefore there'd be nothing like hydronization. You just have a relative phase between those those states. You know, it's only because of this mapping, generally complicated mapping between the uh, Rapidities and the momenta that you have this effective hydronization. But but I guess what I'm wondering is is it that the typical is the statement then that the typical particle doesn't have enough time to get to the next particle, but this is high momentum parts of the wave function colliding, or is this saying that you have a highly entangled state and so single particle physics state? So what you have is uh, you have a wave function which is described. You know, it's a many body wave function, which is a uh, many body wave function. And that evolution doesn't require that there's something like semi classical motion from one, one place to another. It is just the evolution of this many body wave function. So, what? Well, right? Okay, so, you have rubidium. But what about this collision? We have, uh, you know, rubidium. So, you have rubidium. So, I guess my question is would you still see this effect? If you could go to a Feshbach resonance and turn off the interactions for that very short time interval, right? Or or would or, or um, does it like does it require that you have the many body state and then you're seeing single particle dynamics on a short time, or is it actually interacting physics on that short time? If that distinction makes sense. So, uh, yeah, I mean. I'm trying to think of when when you go to non-interacting, whether that's different or what happens for the evolution. When you say if you did the opposite thing, which I think is easier to answer, if you start off with no interactions and then you punch down to a high interaction, then you would see higher ionization the same. Right. So I vaguely think that it must be true in reverse. It's just a funny situation with no interaction when you look at the evolution. The next slide is the main ways. Interesting. But certainly, if you were well, from really whatever state, if you change the interaction, you change you know, the local, the city, you're not locally uh, uh, pre thermalized, then you're going to get this. Yeah, uh, thanks, Dave. Uh, really interesting talk. Do you have a um, feeling for how the phenomenology may differ if the sign of this, the, the interaction went negative? Do we still talk about rapidities? And uh, I mean, I think I read that the beta on sots is going to apply. And you know, yeah. So, so uh, 
you have an expert right here actually same uh you know to that question which is that uh the problem is if all you do is have this you change the sign of interaction then you have instabilities which lead to uh the formation of progressively larger uh bubbles or collections of atoms and the whole thing just tends to collapse but if you do something like have a long range cycle interaction you can stabilize that and then the uh, GAT works pretty well even for the negative you know, once you if you do something to stabilize the uh your one d gas then then you can still describe it you have to avoid the divergence anything else you want to say about that it works as long as you as long as you do something hmm. um i was intrigued by how well this ghp work you were sort of you know, 11 particles per trap and i'm curious what happens if as you go down to the limit of two does the mean is the mean behavior still well described by okay so so i guess i'm going to answer the question for two but uh, let me add a little bit more it does seem shocking that it was just a uh, small number so if you just had say 11 particles and uh you did the uh not the gg got there's the real count then you would see these for Dell oscillations in this, right? You would see something in the distribution that shows that there's there's some uh, you know quantization of the number of particles. But the reason we don't see anything like that in the period of experiments is because we're always averaging over not just 10, but 11 and 9, and, and all those oscillations just sort of smooth out. But uh, but still with you know, so there's something that we're missing in a sense by by doing the average. But the thing which is notable is that the way the rest of it beyond those oscillations work is just the same. And there, I think it's because the whole thing is derived by these wave functions, and they are sort of fluid like you know, you know, It's not like there's a particle here, you have to have some number of particles in the cell. The whole thing is just a, uh, a wave function, it might be spread over a bunch of cells. And, uh, and, then, and so, yeah, if you went down to two, <laughs> I think the dynamics are simpler, right? I mean, uh, so I think describing it in terms of I mean it, it may be possible that it would not like it, but you need to have at least some. Right? But I, yeah, I don't know if there's a point. But I mean already at already at 11, there is something that would probably change. Yeah, just to just to follow up on that in maybe a slightly different way. So you're measuring uh, expectation value over a large number of tubes and is there, do you have any interest in, um, you know, doing the hard work to look at distributions for a single tube and then, you know, get at fluctuations? And I mean, I think you would have an interesting so, measurement problem there. So there's, um, there are a set of experiments that use single tubes and uh, usually it happens on, on chips or, you know, BCs on chips with the long yeah. tubes. In all those experiments to date, they are confined to the very low coupling limit because the density has to be extremely high, and or and because they're not uh, trapped transversely as tightly as we are. So there are experiments that look at those correlations. We look at correlations, but only local correlations, because then you can average over all the tubes. That's the problem, right? But if you if you were talking about doing correlations at finite distances, then the fact that we have all these tubes as you directly into it, it would just smear it. You know, uh, I would say that with the kind of tight trapping that you have with the lattice, the way to, you know, the, the next frontier in terms of trying to go see different phenomena more clearly would be to have uh, a flat distribution. So each, even if you didn't have, uh, uh, you have even if you might install a bunch of tubes, if you had the same number of atoms in each tube, then uh, there are features of the physics that you could see that are masked by the. So that's something that we're more considering doing. The uh, the switch to a single tube is uh, it's just a different technology. I mean, you're hard pressed to have a single tube. I, I mean, the best you know tightly enough uh, confined, and, and also I mean, see that. 
second one noise is pretty good, right? Where I was thinking single tube, single, single lab. Single tube, single lab infection. So yeah, you just like when you did when you made your measurement, you collapsed across your array of eleven. I think it'd be kind of interesting too. Yeah. I mean, I think I think there probably will be in science over the course of uh, uh, the next decade someone who does a single atom infection on a single tube. But probably that would be a single tube on an average chip, and then there would be you know some other detection. And then you could see. Like, I, I just the other thing I would say is that it's a lot of work if you know what you're going to see. Yeah. Thing that I like about this is that uh, we did a lot of work to get what we knew was going to happen. Model, clinical model. It's an exact solution. We weren't testing that theory. We were just testing our experiment. But then everything in the non-equilibrium limit is unknown physics. You know, well, unknown physics. Start doing the experiment. Okay. Uh, last question, John. Does any of this physics persist on a lattice? Uh, I, Yes. You mean a one a lattice? One like, a, like a 1D lattice trans monster. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I don't know about a 1D lattice trans monster, what the limit is, but I think if, if you do this on a lattice uh, with a low enough density of excitations or low enough density of particles, then, it's space, it's then it works pretty, should be uh, pretty accurate. I think eventually, if uh, you know, say if you have particles where there's uh, it's not a low density uh, on that lattice, the excitations are not a low density on the lattice, then that is a way that is, in fact, the way that we're pursuing for uh, controllably lifting your ability. And then it, this won't work like this, but maybe something else. Hey, thank you. Thank you.